Hello, everyone. Welcome to Agitation Rising, your source for local leftist independent journalism in Central Illinois and beyond. My name is Zachary Gitrich, and here I am very thankfully joined uh, by um, Imam Mazar Mahmoud. And today we are going to be discussing the ongoing uh, conflict and Israel-Palestine. So, Imam, please uh, do us the favor of introducing yourself. My name is uh, Imam Mazhar Mahmoud. I'm from Peoria, Illinois. And uh, I do a lot of things in the academic as well as the religious world. Uh, currently, I serve as the Director of Religious Affairs at the Islamic Foundation of Peoria. And uh, I am involved in organizing these rallies once again to hopefully bring, up, bring about a voice of reason, justice, and peace for what's happening in Palestine. And along with that, I serve on various Islamic academic boards as well. All right, well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, are you Palestinian? By heart. In your heart, you're Palestinian? Um, By heart, I'm you... Palestinian. Uh, I'm actually from Canada originally, uh, okay. born and raised. Um, my parents, my grandparents, my uh, ancestry hails from Iraq, but okay. I'm born and raised in Canada. Okay. Um, and have you ever been to Israel, Palestine? No, uh, I got close. I was in Jordan two years ago, but unfortunately, the uh, borders were closed um, during COVID time. And okay. even if the borders were open, they harassed Muslims like crazy at the uh, sort of what they call the Israeli border. They harass Muslims like crazy. One of my colleagues from Bloomington, Imam Saad, he actually tried to make the journey and he was stopped for about 16 hours. And even after 16 hours, they told him that we need to further do, you know, we need to do some further research about you. And he just said, you know, I give up. And he turned back, he took his passport and he left back to Jordan. And, and, and who is it specifically that's controlling the border? This is the Israeli forces, correct? That have complete control over the border? Yes. For the Palestinian side, uh, unfortunately, it's occupied territories that are the ones controlling the border. And they cause much havoc, much discrimination goes on, lots of oppression. Yeah. So can you t describe to us what the current situation is in Gaza right now? You know, people say it's an overstatement when you call it a genocide, but I'll call it exactly what that, that it is a genocide. They've been blocked off from water, food, medical resources, bare minimal necessities that any human being needs to survive and not only that they're telling or they're being bossed around basically on where to go in their own lands first they said you know go from the north to the south on the way they blow up people to pieces you know the zionist government and then once they're in the south they tell them to go near the rafah border even more and they blow up the south and uh, it doesn't take Einstein to recognize that this is an ethnic cleansing that is being facilitated by the various governments around the world for this, occupa for this occupation that is in that land of Palestine. And just to be clear for anybody watching, um, there will there will be some people that claim that, oh, it was actually Hamas uh, bombing people that were trying to leave. The IDF has essentially admitted that they have, in fact, bombed people that were trying to leave. They've bombed UN um, refugee camps. So the IDF has already admitted to a lot of these different things yeah. that are going on. Um, I was just looking up today. I heard that the death toll in Gaza is near 20,000. Um, I don't. I don't know. Many still under the rubble. Yeah, is is that what you've heard? Yeah, I heard it was about seventeen thousand, and once again with many under the rubble. Uh, you could say twenty thousand. 
you know, uh, with everyone that's under the rubble, or perhaps more, you know, God knows. Yeah. Um, yeah, you make a very important point, Zach. Um, the Haaretz newspaper in Israel actually admitted, and by their admission, they mentioned that even on the day of October 7th, where the various individuals at the music festival were shot down, they were actually shot down by Israeli helicopters because they made such a rash moment, uh, a rash movement uh, and decision because they couldn't distinguish from up top as it's their habit, you know, to bomb the smithereens out of Gaza, mainly using the uh, airplanes, the warplanes and the helicopters that they have. Even on October 7th, they couldn't distinguish uh, what they claim as Hamas militants from their own population. And uh, when you see the pictures and the videos from October 7th, especially in the area of the music festival, first of all, uh, Hamas claims that we got nowhere near there. Secondly, they don't even have the weaponry to do the damage that you know, you see with those cars and with those uh, fields and those people who are there, you know. Um, and then once again, to top it off, their admission just brings those doubts into clarity. That, yeah, we were the one who had to shoot up the place. Yeah, and we'll get to um, October 7th uh, in a little bit. Um, but, but I did want to ask a couple of other questions. What is the sure. phrase? What does the phrase "from the river to the sea" mean to you? Because we've heard a lot of different debate uh, amongst different people about what that phrase means. Yeah, local J Zionist leaders in Peoria actually took me up on that as well, uh, and they actually said that you're calling for the eradication of Jews. Well, and, number and by, one, and by local sorry? people, do you and by local? Zionist, do you mean like Sue Katz of the Jewish Federation of Peoria? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just to be clear to everybody, Agitation Rising has reached out to Sue Katz to do an interview. Hopefully she will get back to us. I would be more than happy to interview her or any other representatives of the Jewish Federation of Peoria. But I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead and uh, continue, Imam. Yeah, she actually uh, tried to guilt trip me on that from the river to the sea. And I mentioned that it has nothing to do with the eradication of Jews because at the end of the day, the original population of Palestine before it became called Israel, uh, it was Muslims, it was Jews, it was Christians living in harmony, side by side, peacefully. When we say from the river to the sea, these individuals who are in prison in their own lands and in their own homes. We are calling for freedom from that. The Palestinians who are living there, you know, in that strip, they don't have voting rights. Their kids are butchered every single day. The youngins are in prison under age and at times held without trial for years, as we've seen. You have checkpoints, very, very sophisticated checkpoints in Palestine, in the West Bank itself. So in other words, when a person is saying free Palestine from the river to the sea, that all this nonsensical, irrational, genocidal, uh, you know, this uh, aspect that is occurring, we are calling for freedom from that. And yes, we do believe that, you know, Jews, Christians and Muslims have a right to that land. But the Jews who are from that land, not people who claim uh, that, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago, some grandparent of theirs lived there. But when you try to ask them to do a DNA test, right, or an ancestry test, you, you find out that these things are ruled out in Israel. Uh, you can't have a DNA test. Why? Because most of the people will find out that they're not even from that land. 
and, 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 you, and you mentioned Zionism earlier. What does Zionism mean to you? So Zionism and what it means has evolved over the years. Yeah. Right. The there's original a lot of different doctrine. types of Zionism as well. There's different kinds. Sure. There's religious Zionism, sure. national Zionism, etc. So, so as a man of faith, uh, off the bat, I'll say Zionism is not uh, equivalent to Judaism, and being anti-Zionist is not being anti-Jew, because there are Jewish people who are against Zionism as well. Um, and to top it off even more, being anti-Israel or anti-Zionism does not equate to being anti-Semitic. Because number one, there are Jewish people who are against the occupation of Palestine as well. That's number one. Number two, Palestinian people, Arabs in themselves are Semitic people. When they're calling for their rights, they're not calling for the uh, extermination of Jews who were part and parcel of that land. Interestingly, Zach, if you look at sort of the old resistance movements, you know, when, you know, the first sort of the first movements who tried to battle it out and get their freedom from the Zionists, you should see their logo. It's, you know, a crescent of Islam, a cross, and a menorah of the Jews. That was their actual symbol. You know, what time, in what other time words, period, what time period are you talking about? Uh, this is post-1948. Okay, okay. Yeah, post-1948. That was their symbol, actually. You know, the three uh, acclaimed symbols of the three, you know, major faiths, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. That was actually, what do you call it? That was their logo, you know, on their flag. Yeah. And so you've you've explained what you know that anti-Zionism does not mean um, anti-Semitism, but again, what does Zionism itself mean to you? Like like like, what do you think that the Zionist project is that the Zionists want? Calling for a state for the Jewish people, uh, even if uh, now it means perhaps even if it's not their land, as uh, you know. And going back to that, sorry, going back to that thought of free Palestine from the river to the sea. Well, Netanyahu's party has said something similar, but not in this, not in the case of freeing that land from oppression, rather from yeah. with the idea of bringing more oppression to that land. You know, a few years ago, he actually presented the map of Israel in the United Nations, and it was that entire, you know, area, including the West Bank and Gaza. So their vision is not to take just what they already have or what they've already taken but their vision is to take that entire land and more yeah and that right. phrase is part of the Likud, which is the um the, the political party that benjamin netanyahu belongs to that's part of their platform from the river to the yeah. sea um do, no do they don't say from the river to the sea they say like from from some from the jordan river to something else but it's like a different phrase that they Okay. And, and do you believe that Israel is an apartheid state? A hundred percent. Without a doubt. If you if you remove um, the word Jew or Jewish from the Israeli constitution and you add what white colonialists, it'll make sense. What they're doing is exactly just that. Because even black Jews are not safe. You know, the Ethiopian Jews who came from Ethiopia, even they're not safe from the vile crimes of this occupation, where uh, some of the women, Jewish women who came once again for an alleged better future to the land of occupied Palestine, what they call Israel, they got steril sterilized without their consent, you know, so they couldn't have babies. And then they found this out later on. And that's just, uh, you know, that's just very minimal in terms of the crimes that they're committing. The entire skin banks that you hear of, right? The harvesting of organs, right? From Palestinian I'm, prisoners. I'm not, I'm not familiar with this. So, so, so you, could you go into detail? Israel has one of the largest skin banks in the world. In many cases, when these Palestinians, they find 
their deceased ones or their killed ones brought back home, they're told you cannot open the casket and you have to bury the box as is. And they're told things like, you know what? Um, you just have to bury the box as is. And when some Palestinian families actually open the boxes, they find skin missing. They find, you know, organs missing. Um, and there was a admission from various medical sources in what they call Israel that we have engaged in harvesting organs without consent. But this is just some of the brutality that you hear from those nuns. So there are, there are some that will say, look, there are Arab Israelis that ostensibly have equal rights under the law. They're these Arab Israelis. They're part of the pol the parliament. They're in the court system. And they say that this shows that Israel is not an apartheid state. What, what is your... They don't say that. The second... Yeah, they don't say I'm, that, by I, the I, way. I'm they, saying, well, I, so, I'm, I'm sorry. That, that I, are you saying I the parliament? Are you saying the people in the parliament say that? I'm saying that pro-Israel supporters will use oh. this argument as a way okay. to refute the idea that Israel is an apartheid state. That's not true at all, because Arab Israelis they live as second citizens. So, uh, you know, they are, they live as second-class citizens. Uh, there's much oppression on them as well. We've actually, in the Palestinian world, we feel sorry for them. Not only that, you should see some of the clips from their parliament and how, uh, you know, these, so these, once again, alleged Arab parliament leaders are heckled. You know, they're interrupted. Their motions are not even supported, you know. Uh, even when some of their own people in parliament try to say that don't these kids in Gaza matter, you find other, you know, uh, parliamentary, uh, you know, people in the parliament from the left side, even from the left side, I'm not saying the extreme right or the right, from the far left side or the left side, actually saying that, no, you know what, uh, uh, an Israeli kid and a Gazan kid can never be the same. So, moving on, they're treated uh, horribly as well. They're treated very miserably. The Arab uh, sort of population there. Yeah. So moving on, moving specifically to Gaza. Um, obviously, Hamas is the main governing body in Gaza. Do you think Hamas is a terrorist organization or is it a resistance movement? It's been classified as a terrorist organization, uh, and so was Malcolm X, so was Martin Luther King, so was um, the Black Panthers, so was Gandhi, you know, apparently one of the most peaceful people, uh, Nelson Mandela. And uh, we have seen a trajectory of these, this word being used and misused as well. However, I would say something else in terms of this conversation, I would say, if there was no occupation, there would be no Hamas. It's as simple as that. If there was no occupation, uh, there would be no Hamas. That's number one. Number two, people say Hamas is in Gaza. Well, what about the West Bank then? Why are people being killed in, on a daily basis in the West Bank? There's no Hamas there. That is led by the Palestinian Authority. Why are, why are the killings happening there? Why are the brutalities happening there? Just a week ago, three kids from of one of you know the three kids in Beitin, which is an area in the West Bank, uh, they were killed, and they were actually relatives of one of our business owners here. What were those kids Hamas as well in the West Bank, or were they human shields for what for their parents? You know, it's just absurd. You know, when you bring Hamas and you know when people bring Hamas into the conversation, just talk about the West Bank where Hamas is not even there, right? Even if you want to call Hamas a terrorist organization, or even if a, you know, I would call them a terrorist organization. 
at the end of the day, I would say that even places where there is no presence of Hamas, they're being brutalized. So, so you do you do believe that in some cases Hamas has committed terrorist actions? Well, what would typically classify as terrorist actions, which usually terrorism is defined as kind of indiscriminate killing of civilians and innocent civilians for political or social reasons. So once things come to light after every now and then, they once again by their own testament they say that they're after the military. They're not after civilians. We saw the videos of how they released the civilians. You know, uh, these went viral on social media where the civilians are smiling. And, you know, they actually, by their admission, said that we had to take civilians in order to free the 20,000 such, you know, hostages that are in Israeli prisons. Uh, and that was a defense mechanism that we used in order to free uh, people from the Israeli prisons, children, women, who, are, who haven't even been convicted of anything. They said this was something that we had to do. As for the music festival, and as for uh, civilians, etc., you know, being unalive, they claim that they had nothing to do with that. Um, once again, uh, the West has a reputation of calling anyone and everyone a terrorist. Uh, who is perhaps not their ally, or who is perhaps, who who is perhaps, uh, you know, not in sync with the, their agenda. I'll give you the example of the uh, Taliban, or sorry, the. Um, oh wait, wait, wait! I, I'm, I'm sorry. Hold on. Are, are you saying that Hamas was not responsible for any of the killings that happened at the music festival, or in the kibbutz? villages that are i'm not saying that around. people on, people on the ground people on the ground actually said when we were being shot at these militant people who came from gaza they tried to calm us down i'm not saying that they had and they they shot up people at the music festival they're actually they actually said that yes we attacked the military areas and that was our target we have nothing to do with civilians so, so who was it that attacked the music festival or the kibbutz? It was IDF. It was the Israeli authorities. This is mentioned in the Haaretz newspaper. This is in the Haaretz newspaper, and <clears throat> they've admitted to these atrocities that they've indiscriminately shot from helicopters and planes people who perhaps were militant and people who were perhaps their own population. I mean, like, I mean, I, I do want to be clear. Like, we do have videos of maybe they were Hamas, maybe they were other members of Gaza that did attack people, like at this festival in, in these kibbutz regions. I'm not saying every single allegation that yeah, was made the music, before. the music festival. No, that's actually that actually that actually has been clarified as of now that it was, uh, you know, their own. Israeli authorities who shot at that. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I understand that the IDF, there was definitely friendly fire involved. I, I mean, I don't know to what extent it was. Obviously, the original number was 1,400. Then they had to bring that down to 1,200 because it sounds like 200 were um, lost. And now it's at were. 900, by the way. It's at 900 now. Do you believe that the Israeli Defense Forces... Like but once again, um, sorry, I just wanted to say, I, I have I have already said it, and I want to emphasize on it once again that you will find resistance, and at times you will find resistance that enters into the parameters of terrorism when you block off a people to such an extent where they have no life anymore. And that is why I go back to my original statement that the problem is not with Hamas, rather it's with the occupation. The day the occupation ends, you will see these people cease to exist. In fact, in some of the interviews with various uh, militant members from Gaza, when the interviewer asked, what would you do if Palestine became free today, if you had freedom? The guy said, I would go to a beach. 
and enjoy myself and have a normal job. That's number one. Number two, this indiscriminate killing that Israel is engaging in, where these kids see their parents and their brothers and sisters being, being blown to pieces. You think this kid will just sit there and not do anything about it? You are literally, by occupation and by genocide, becoming facilitators of more militants to be born. That's what that's what yeah. this is doing. Yeah, we, we, we've talked we've talked a little bit about October seventh, and again, as of the recording of this, we're exactly two months from October seventh. Um, do you believe the Israeli Defense Forces engages also in terrorist actions? Yeah, of course, a hundred percent. Yeah. So people question the day of October seventh. They should question the day, the ter the terrorism of eighth, ninth, the tenth, and all the way up till now, where these yeah. hospitals, these bakeries, these water towers, these children, these elders have been bombed to pieces. These are questions that people should ask as well. That you know, it's not a single side. You know, it's not a. a it, there's no prejudice when it comes to uh, evil or terrorism. Call it for what it is. So, do, do, uh, Hamas was elected back in, I believe, 2006. They received about 42, 43% of the vote, um, and they've been in charge since then. There doesn't appear to have been any elections um, since then, even though, based on some polling, it shows that a lot of Gazans still have a lot of support for Hamas. In fact, a lot of people in the West Bank also are somewhat supportive of Hamas. Do you think Hamas are good stewards to the Gazans that they rule over? I'm not really sure, to be honest. I'm not part and parcel of the local population. I don't know what they've conducted, how they've been supporting their local population. Uh, but yeah, you find many voices in Gaza, in the West Bank, supportive of this party that's been... Um, classified or that's been given the title of being terrorist by the US and Great Britain and others. Um, but one could ask that, you know, if they were not happy with them, then why the support? Yeah. Um, what, what do you think an appropriate response by Israel in the wake of October 7th would have been? I would say, uh, you know, if they actually Number one, if you ask me, I would say end occupation. Everyone go back to your homes. You know, the, the people who left on October 7th, uh, following that day, over a million Israelis, they went to their place of other citizenship. You know, let people go home and, you know, give the land to who it belongs to. But somebody might call it bias, my perspective. Uh, but I would say, you know, if you want, or if, if Israel wanted to do something about it, they should have uh st strategically you know gone in and targeted these uh alleged tunnels that they continuously talk about but they'll never do that because since on the ground they've lost so many of their tanks and so many of their so much of their weaponry so hence they decide to take their grievances uh off or they they try to execute these grievances by bombing up little children you know i would say you know if they have the right to defend themselves then defend themselves fairly go ahead you have strategic soldiers you have special forces go ahead you know go ahead and finish the hamas that you uh, claim to be putting an end to but zach let me tell you it has never ever been about hamas it has always been about taking up more land and annexation. This is not me, Madhar, saying this. This is the Israeli soldiers on the ground in Gaza recording videos and putting up, putting them up on Instagram and other social media places where they're saying that we're conquering Gaza. You know, we are going to make this our land. We're going to build homes here. This is the, this is what they're saying. Their vision is not even about Hamas. Their vision is how to just get another strip of land and put the name Israel on that. 
Okay, and I only have a couple more questions, and I, I appreciate your time. What needs to happen in order for this specific conflict right here to end? I'm not talking about the whole right resolution of conflict between Palestinians and Israelis, but just the current war that's going on in Gaza. What, what, what do you think needs to happen in order for this to end? Number one, defund Israel. Tell the world, tell the governments of the world to defund Israel. And number two, take them to task for the hundreds and thousands of international humanitarian violations that they engaged in, not only since October 7th, but before that. Take them to task in the criminal courts of the world for that. Call the criminals the criminals, you know, and speak to justice and truth. Once humanity becomes champions of humanity itself and justice and truth you will find that the problems that we see happening in this world and the problems that you see happening in gaza they will cease to exist but unfortunately this is just one person talking and it's a long shot because governments are not doing their job leaders are not acting like leaders and it's the dollar that shines and talks. Yeah. I, I, so obviously the Biden administration, I mean, Pres President Joe Biden has had a long history of just unequivocally supporting Israel um, going back decades. I mean, he's been a politician for you. Do you think people that support freeing Palestine should vote for, should vote for Joe Biden or vote for the Democrats in, in, as long as they hold these positions? I don't know. Yeah, no. okay. you I don't know. Okay. I don't know because uh, at the end of the day, no matter who you vote for, it's like there's an unequivocal agreement when it comes to Israel in between both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. I don't know if there are in the, in the independent candidates who will not sing fight for Palestine, but just fight for the truth, fight for justice. Yeah. I'm not sure. Do you think that do you think that the other Arab leaders in the world are doing enough to support Palestinians? No. In fact, uh, in a Palestinian circle, we call them all sellouts because at the end of the day, all of them either directly or indirectly have ties to uh, ties with Israel. And, and what more could they be doing to support Palestine? <laughs> They could, number one, stop the political ties with Israel that they have. That should be a start. And from there, hopefully follow up with their humanity and try their best, along with the world's or the governments of the world, to free and oppress people. Um, and, and last question, and this might be a, a little bit of a big one. You know, what, is, what is the ultimate solution to the ongoing conflict? We hear a lot of people talk about how they want a two-state solution. Um, obviously, the Netanyahu government has been very clear that they really only want a one-state solution, and that is the creation of, you know, kind of a Jewish ethno-state. Um, I'm going to bring up onto the page, so you should be able to, to see this. Right. So this is the history of um, the, the settler colonial project. And right now, we're over at the very far right. Do yep. you think that given the conditions um, that a two-state solution is even possible anymore? Because if you look over at the West Bank, you know, it's not like it was in the second to the right where it was all contiguous. It's all broken up. I'm yeah, going to bring in a, a better map of just the West Bank. Yeah. So this will be a, yeah. a little bit hard to see for some people, but the West Bank is split up basically into three areas, area A, B, and C. And so these kind of large, like darker tan areas, that's area A, and they are basically, they are governed by the Palestinian Authority, which is basically controlled by Fatah. The slightly lighter tan areas that are around it are considered area B, and they're they're kind of ruled by Fatah, but technically there's Israeli forces. 
And then the entire rest of the uh, of the area in this in which you can see is area C, and it makes up about two thirds of all the land, and it's completely controlled by um, by the Israelis. And these dark blue areas you see are the settlements that have been built by the Jewish settlers, and it's it's not the situation that these are just tents, right? These are well, this is, a lot of infrastructure has been built into this. These are well constructed homes. You know, there, there, there's a lot of areas and roads that Palestinians are simply not even allowed to travel. So, I mean, is a two-state solution even possible anymore? No, it's not. To be honest, it's not. And no Palestinian will say we want a two-state two -state solution. And if they say that, that will be an inferior position that they adhere to. Their primary position would be to say that we want our land back. I've never ever heard a Palestinian saying that my primary preference is to have a two-state solution. Every single Palestinian will say that we want our homes back, number one. Or they'll say at an you know, inferior sort of secondary level or as a final resolution perhaps, that fine, you know what, let's have a two-state solution. You know, basically give up their rights. Um, but once again, that is not the Zionist vision as well. Uh, in their case, they want the entire land as well. Right? They want to annex Palestine. Put an end to any indigenous population there and people who don't support them. So, so if a one-state solution is the only possibility, do you think that the Palestinian people would accept a one-state solution where they are given full rights, where the nation-state laws are repealed, and where the right to return for Palestinians um, is guaranteed? Do you think that that would be the, the, really the only solution available anymore? That would be the only solution available, regardless, regardless and they would what, they would also want the settlers to leave, you know. And how will a million plus or millions of people who got land for free, citizenship for free, in a land that has nothing to do with them, how will the they just end up leaving? The settlers in the West Bank or the settlers in all of uh, of Israel, everywhere. Every, you're, everywhere. Because you're talking Every, about 7 million people at that point. Exactly. Like 7 million That's why, you know, when you ask, do you, how do you see the conflict ending? The conflict's not going to end. It's not going to end. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Because these people are thirsty to go back home. What, what people are thirsty to go back home? I'm sorry. The Palestinians. Yeah, the Palestinians want to go back home, but you you don't see a solution where there can be a single state where you have to choose. No, oh no, I do, I do, I do. But it would be the original, or the descendants of the original population of Palestine. That would be the only solution. Otherwise, having some dude coming from New York and live, you know, and stealing my home and saying that I have to agree with that. Um, that's not going to bring about any solutions. That's just going to bring about a further rising in agitation to take from your name. I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree with you. And the earliest settlers were definitely from Europe. They originally came from Russia, Ukraine, and Poland. Um, but a large percentage of the ethnic Jews in Israel now are from the Middle East. They're Persian, they're um, the, it may even be a plurality. I don't think they're a majority of a plurality of them are from the Middle East. I mean, would they be able to go back to these nations that are, you know, majority Muslim, majority Arab? They do have huge populations of Jews, for example, in Iran, in Morocco, etc. Uh, but once again, you know, these are just whims these are just dreams the reality of the matter is that this conflict has no end 
and it's going to keep going and going and going because nobody will do what's ideal at the end of the day. All right, so I do thank you very much for your time. Um, I know that you have a protest coming up this weekend, uh, Sunday, December 10th, uh, 2023 at 1 p.m. on the corner of Maine University in Peoria, Illinois. Is that correct? Correct. We'll see you guys there. Is there any final statements that you would like to make uh, before we, we end? Just support humanity and justice. Call the wrong for what it is. Be champions of what's correct, what's right, your humanity. And um, don't let history repeat itself. History of colonialism and occupation uh, that we see in our lands over or in the lands over here that we're living in. Don't let that be repeated in an era where we or where we know about human rights and people are on a daily basis advocating human rights and uh, for gen z in an era of social media where actually where you're actually you know seeing everything happening in front of you you know don't lock your hearts up all right well thank you so much for your time amount i really appreciate it um and i hope you have a good rest of your day okay thank you take care so I need to make a couple of real quick comments about what the imam was saying about the October 7th attacks. Because he seemed to be suggesting that when Hamas did their attack on October 7th, that they only targeted the uh, military forces. Um, and that the people that died uh, or were attacked at the music festival, at these small kibbutz villages, that that was done by the IDF. So he mentioned an article um, that did confirm that at least some people were killed by IDF soldiers um, when they finally responded after, you know, many, many hours after the Hamas attack. But let's be clear, like Hamas recorded themselves attacking people at this festival. They recorded themselves attacking people at these kibbutz villages. So that that's not really... I mean, I, I mean, it's it's very clear that they absolutely were involved uh, in those attacks. It's the reason that they have hostages from those villages. Um, so it was, it's it, the imam was making it seem as if um, the IDF committed those attacks. But then again, how? Why is it that Hamas is now the one releasing the hostages that they took? Um, so that's really the only thing that I wanted to correct out of this interview. Um, I do hope that you all enjoyed it, and thank you. Thank you so much for turning into Agitation Rising, your source for local, leftist, independent journalism in central Illinois and beyond. You can always find our articles on our blog, link in the description. Please like, subscribe, and comment. Agitation Rising is under the Strange Corners of Thought umbrella, so feel free to contribute directly to our Patreon, or donate via PayPal or Cash App. Again, links in the description. Keep agitating, keep rising, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks.